we'll get started. And before I get too far along here, I need to make one more adjustment. And that'll take just a few minutes to get this up and running. But as soon as we get this part done, we'll be able to slide on through because it's going to take a little while to get through this part seven. There's a lot here. Um, it's it's somewhat delicate, you might say. And then other parts of it are just a little bit uh, challenging to put into words. I have to watch my words real careful in uh, speaking about this particular series in this part. Now, as you might recall, last week we were talking about what is what my solution was to my failed marriage situation. I married the third time. I was 20, I was still in my 20s, and I've already been married three times, and I thought maybe the solution would be if I married a country girl that came from a large family, that marriage would work. Now, I'm stacking all my pros and cons in the wrong way. I realized that, and I realized that years ago. However, at that point in time in my life, I had no one to direct me or even suggest to me what would be a proper marriage. You know, most of us go into marriage and we think, well, we can only be who we were raised to be by those who raised us. That's what we'll be. And so we do turn out a little bit like those people who raised us, you know, mom and dad. Sometimes it's not a mom and dad. Sometimes it's a stepmom or a stepdad. Sometimes it's a grandma. Sometimes it's aunt and uncle. Sometimes it's uh, somebody you didn't even know. You, they got you out of foster care. You know, it's, everybody's got their own story. But the good part about all this is no matter what your story is, there's a purpose in it. And what we're looking for is the purpose of why these things happen to you and for what good reason do they have for you today. Apostle Paul said it best. He said, by the measure you're abased, thrown down, will determine the height that you will be evaluated or ex, uh, lifted up. Um, if you're abased, you shall abound. But it does give you the measurement of how far you will abound. So he says, praise those things that you are abased in because it will come back around to determine how high you will fly with the Lord some point in time. Now, most people would think, well, that's just about how many people we witness to and how, many, how much prostitution prosecution you came under, uh, how much criticism, um, maybe even martyred, but that's not what it's all saying. Part of that's true, yes, but mostly just things that happen to you in life have precedence. They have purpose, and finding out what that is gives you the ability to be able to utilize that experience and not waste it. Every, every grape that's crushed will make wine. But a grape that doesn't make wine and is not eaten as a grape will turn into a raisin. Just wrinkle up and have no value except to be a raisin. So, so much for that analogy. Um, the thing I want to talk about today is about where I was at and what happened at that point in time when I found out my thought of having a country girl as a wife would be would work did not really work not because mainly not because of her but it was more about my secretary as you might recall if you don't know just go find part six and catch up with us you'll find out what i'm talking about but as a result of that it still hurt it was still a bad situation so you know i really had to find out okay god what is the answer to this solution i I'm trying to be a good man, a good husband, faithful husband, and yet for all that, I get kicked to the curb. I don't understand what's going on. So here we are. I'm coming out of uh, a place in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm moving to Ponca City. My, my wife, who we're now divorced, was going to move up there with me and start over, but at the day I was all packed up, ready to go, she said, well, I'll meet you there. And she said that she would uh, meet me there as soon, as soon as I get moved in. So I went and rented a place that was big enough for the whole family, her and our daughter. And, you know, that never happened because it was all a lie. It was all, you know, fictitious. So 
here we, I've gone through that situation. My 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 secretary came back around even a year after that, uh, and then that's when I found out what she had been doing to destroy my marriage so that she could leave her husband and be with me, which was nuts. Just absolutely drove me crazy, put a lot of pain in my life, and I thought this all this for this this is what you want to hurt somebody bad this so bad you think they're gonna love you after that? Yeah, you crazy as you're in a bat, you know. So anyway, went through the situation and that, and then I found out, okay, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do, Lord. I don't know what the answer is. I I don't I don't wanna really get married again. I mean, this is not working for me, so you know, three times and strike you're out, you know. Um, and I, I still tried to make a, a make a life for myself uh, and working in the bank and, you know, trying to get ahead in life. But it was really hard because I found out that I don't do so well when I'm just working for me. I do a lot better and I, and I become a lot more successful in what I do in banking when I'm supporting somebody else. When I'm doing this for the family, not just for myself, um, so it became a situation where I realized I have to uh, learn how to do this without having anybody else in my life, and I thought I was going to be able to handle that. But it came a point in time where um, being a, a vice president of a bank in a large bank, largest bank in that city where I was at in Ponca City, and and having a single behind my name made me a target once again and so here I am finding myself uh, inundated with all kinds of situations that really were odd peculiar and not really wanted but nonetheless you still have to deal with it well one person came along who was nine years older than me had two children they were teenagers now you think about this they're nine years older than I. I'm 29 years old, and they're 13 and 15. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, okay, God, what am I? What is this? You know, I'm I I feel for this gal. Her, uh, I guess you would say, boyfriend attorney was uh, he was married, but yet they had a relationship that I didn't know about at that particular point in time. I just knew that she talked about him a lot and that. He helped her out a lot because she had been through a lot. And that's where the title comes in, A Woman with a Troubled Past. And that's where the also warning comes in about this being a rated portion of the program because some of the things I'm going to talk about are not for just everyone's ear. They're, they're, they're really hard. And what really impressed me about this particular woman was that she'd been through all these things, these horrible, traumatic things in her life, and she still was sane. I figured anybody that went through all she's been through would be insane. You'd be just, I mean, you wouldn't be able to even function. But that's what really caught my attention, and I felt like, well, maybe someone older would maybe respect my gentleness, my kindness, and my ways of doing things that I felt were right and not cost me such pain and agony that my other three marriages had. So I'm going into this in chronological order, if you will, in that the fact that, you know, finding this person was not something that I went and I didn't just go looking for somebody. Actually, uh, I, I met her at uh, the country club where a lot of things were going on. I was with uh, some bankers. We were at a meeting, and she was with her attorney friend and a group from his uh, legal firm, and they were having a get-together in the same area where we were at, which I said, who is that? And they told me, oh, you know, she's so-and-so, and you don't want to get too close to her because he's a very powerful attorney. He's, he's known all over Oklahoma. And uh, I said, okay, well, I wasn't planning on it, but Anyway, later, she came tracking me down, and so that's how this all got started, and then um, we got married, and I didn't realize how challenging that would be, but I knew she needed help, but it wasn't all about money. It was help just trying to raise the kids and help with some of the things that happened in her life. Now, after we were married, I started finding out a lot more things about her life, 
but I knew a few things that had happened that were bad enough. But then I started finding out from the beginning of her life how things were. She, um, her mother was a, a full blood Cherokee Indian, whom I had met later on, but her mother was fairly wild, but very beautiful, very attractive woman. Uh, just had those icy blue eyes uh, that you hear about from time to time. And, uh, but at the same time, she was a very evil woman. Uh, at the time, my ex was three years old. Her mom held her down. Like I said, this is warning signal, warning again. If you have any minors that you don't want to hear this, please turn your volume down now and don't let them read my lips. But she was three years old when her mother held her down while her dad raped her. Now, this did not only emotional damage, but physical damage. And that, that led to a situation where she was taken out of the home for a little bit with her grandparents. But it didn't take very long before her grandparents were not of good health and could not take care of her. So she had to go back to the mama who had already remarried. And um, she married many times as well. But she had uh, married men that were, you know, not very good people. In fact, uh, most most of them, if not all of them, had uh, abused her as she was growing up. Um, her mother really didn't care. I guess her mother just figured, well, that's just the way it is. You know, that's just <laughs> that's just the way life is. But then, when she was uh, one day, when she was outside playing. One of her stepdads took the two-year-old, one of her brothers, little brothers, and put him in a number two wash tub and drowned him right there before her eyes, and he threatened her with her life if she told anybody. So she had that on her conscience to live with. Her older brother, that wasn't that much older than her, he she watched as one stepdad had wrapped him up in barbed wire and beat him with a two-by-four. Now, these weren't just stories she was making up because... I did eventually meet her brother, who was a Vietnam vet. He had a lot of trouble. He lived with us for a little while, and uh, he told me about some things. He didn't like talking about any of his past because it was all so painful, uh, and he was still suffering from PTSD from the Vietnam War. Uh, there was a, just a lot of issues in that whole family, and every one of her brothers and sisters that I'd met had stories to tell that were just, you know, you could tell in the way they said it, you could feel the pain in their heart. You could feel the suffering. Now, my dad, my dad always warned me and always scolded me, actually. He said, son, you got to quit bleeding for everybody. And I didn't understand what he meant for a long time. But, you know, I, I got to the place where I understood what he meant. You know, you got you can't help everybody. And that's just the way he said it. You, you can't bleed for everybody, meaning, that, you know, you got to suffer for everybody to help them. But I just told him, I said, Dad, that's who I am. I can't change that. That's just the person I am. I get in these situations because I want to help somebody, and it, and it, usually I get hurt in the situation. But as long as I feel like I'm helping, I, I, I'm I, doing what I feel like I'm created to do. And so as time went on, I realized that there was a lot of other things that she had been through. And um, there was one time in her life where, where it wasn't her her son was nine now you you got to remember when we married he was 15 and her daughter was two years younger so she was seven she was staying at her grandparents uh which was um my ex's uh ex-husband's <laughs> grandparent her his parents staying with them in fact there was a point in time there where when she was having the second child which was a girl she's seven but seven years prior when she was giving birth to her in the hospital, she found out while she was in the hospital having giving birth to the second child that the young girl that was in the same room as her, because they had a split room, it was not split by, by anything other than a curtain, so they spent time talking. And this girl was having a baby, and the she said her boyfriend was going to come in and see her, and it so happened the boyfriend happened to be my ex's husband. So that's she is giving birth to their child, their second child, and she finds out that the girl next to her in the same room is having a child of his too. 
that's got to be an emotional wreck. That's got to set you on a course of, of, of some kind of uh, dementia that would cause you to lose all kinds of memory. But she was tough. She was hard. She was able to deal with these things. And, um, you know, all those things that she dealt with, with all these abuses and watching her brothers get beat or, or drown, all that happened before she was 10 years old. Now, she's very young when she had her first child. You know, she wasn't even out of high school. And here she is dealing with this situation of having a second child and seeing that there was somebody else there, too, who was having a child from the same man. Now, after she had divorced her first husband and was just trying, I guess, to find her way, she, she met a lot of people along the way. But there was a time where she was at home. The daughter was with the grandparents. Her son was there at the home with her. And three men had broke out of uh, McAllister Prison in Muskogee, and they had found their way to her house. I don't think she knew them. It's just so happened that they just happened to break into her house. And uh, they were there all night uh, having their way with her, and she just promised, please don't do anything to my son. You know, uh, I'll do whatever you ask. Just don't don't bother my son. Well, you know, they did whatever they wanted, and they did abuse the son too. So that's another issue that she had to contend with that was very troublesome. It was troublesome for her and troublesome for him. She said that that morning when they left out, they took her TV set, some other things she had, put it in the trunk of her car and took off in her car going down the road as she's standing on the porch screaming, you know, not wearing much. And people began to take notice and call the police. And they eventually caught two of them. But uh, the one, uh, the third one was caught by one of the farmers that they were trying to steal uh, something off his place. And he shot and killed one of them. So the other two were caught, brought into court. Her son did not speak a word for over a year, and it was because of all this trauma. So she's traumatized, he's traumatized, and they're trying to make a living and go through the process. Thankfully, the daughter wasn't there um, because it probably wouldn't be any better for her than it was for them. And as the time went on, that you know there was court hearings and all that, and they eventually were put away for 99 years each. Um, so the, the situation turned into this, that the courts decided, in fact, the representative, and this is where she met the attorney who was her, uh, I guess, I would just say sugar daddy, let's put it that way, because it's really true. He was, you know, helping her get, get these guys put away and also handled other things for her along the way as far as legal battles that she has. And one of them was that she needed some compensation or something that would uh, help in the victimization of what happened to her and her son. So the judge ordered that she go to a, a psychiatrist. And the, the court-appointed psychiatrist in Norman, Oklahoma, she was sent to go there, and her son as well, because her son had not spoken a word over a year. Well, here, I think this is maybe going to blow your mind <laughs> to hear what this uh, highly degreed psychiatrist gave as advice for giving handling the situation to deal with it he said he told her he said what you need to do in order to get through all this rape situation that you've been through and what you've been through in the past is you need to start going to hotels and hang around the lounge area and sleep with different men that are coming in who are traveling salesmen or business people and that'll help you get over it now, isn't that about the most sickest thing you could ever think of to tell somebody? I mean, what kind of mind is that, and what kind of education did they receive in order to give that kind of information? He told the son, who was now 10 years old, that he was now a full-blown homosexual, and he just needed to accept it. He's now homosexual, and this is just the way his life's going to be. That was his resolve for both of them. So... They took the advice not knowing any better, and that's what they did. And that was just a sad, sad situation because 
you know, it led to nothing but more pain, more agony, more abuse. And, you know, it's just it, at that point in time in my life, when I heard that, I was just furious because I knew who the psychiatrist was. I knew I knew where his office was. He was he officed in the same building and they were joint partners in the building of a abortion clinic. So you kind of know where these people's minds are. And I think that it, it also created within me right then to make a decision that I've got to find out some right answers because these people who are getting high educated in these areas are supposed to help people. And I'd taken psychology when I was in college. And, you know, frankly, some of it was interesting, but for all practical purposes, I didn't see how that was going to help anybody. I couldn't see how any of this is going to make any sense in solving and resolving people's problems. So in my inner self, in my spirit, I guess you would say, is that I felt a need to begin to search out to find out how to really help people. I was already bleeding for people. I already had deep feelings for everyone and, and I, everybody I ever met, you know, who had problems. I just immediately adopted the problem with them and went with all out that I had to try to help them solve that problem. So as a result, unbeknowing to me at the time, the Holy Spirit began to show me things about people, reveal things to me. In other words, he showed me the root of the problem, because, and he showed me how everybody's trying to put Band-Aids on these wounds that were cancerous. You can't do it. You've got to find the root of the problem, cut the root, destroy it, and then start the healing process. And it takes some time, but believe me, our the counsel we receive from our God is the only counsel that's worth having. It's the only thing that works. And I've seen him do mighty things. I've seen him do so spectacular things. He's revealed so many things about people to me that some of them had even it had been so suppressed so long they couldn't even remember it happened until it was spoken into the face. And in their face they realized that, wow, it's true, that did happen. And they thought all along it was just a bad dream that they had had. All kinds of different situations occurred. But my point is, this woman of a troubled past with two children, one a homosexual, and really, I don't even think he still even understood what that meant. And after we had been married just a short period of time, we moved from Ponca City to Norman. And that's when I found out about that doctor and where he's at. And we're in a college town. That's where the University of Oklahoma is. And that was probably the worst temptation that we could have put our put those two children under was to put them in a place where they were around all these college people, all these college kids. Uh, I would think probably it's easy to say that 25% of the population in that city were college students because there was that many going there and, the, and it wasn't that large a town. Now, you know, obviously I'm naive. <laughs> Obviously, I was so naive not to understand what kind of uh, pressure I'm putting on my own life by taking in two teenagers. When I'm, you know, it's at, the, at that point in time, I was 29. They were 13, 15, but they got a little bit older, and so did I. So by the time I'm, you know, 32, I realize, you know, uh, this is just, this is a lot to deal with. And one day... I'm sitting downstairs uh, reading a newspaper, watching TV, and come down the stairs is here comes the son, my stepson. He's dressed in drag, all black. This is a 1984. Come. Now you think about it. 1984. How many men did you see in drag? Stiletto heels, black stockings, black dress, and a big old black hat. And then he had the long black gloves. I said, where are you going like that? He said, I'm going to go drive around. I would bought him a Mustang. And I told him, I said, you're not going to go drive around like that. And he said, yeah, I am. And he walked out the door and got in the car. And I went and talked to his mom. I said, you know, I, I'm really worried about him. I said, you know, if the lifestyle he's keeping, he won't live to see 30. And he's still in high school. And... You know, I'd already known about what had happened from the breakout of the prison and what the counselor or what the psychiatrist had said. 
and how they were supposed to resolve all that issue and what it created in his life. And I wanted to really try to help him turn that corner and get out of that. But in the process of doing that, he was more determined to be a homosexual. Now, I'm, I'm just telling you what happened. I'm not trying to make any kind of accusations here because I really cared about these two kids. And speaking of the two, the daughter, she got heavy into drugs in that college scene, and they're still in high school. It got so bad that we had to put her in a um, place in Arizona where she could get delivered of drugs, get cleaned up, and get free of it. Well, while she was there, we got a phone call that she had left, ran away. And so we had everybody looking. We even had the attorney friend of my ex contact him. He was contacting the governor of, of Kansas and, and Arkansas and all through these different areas where they would, she had been because she went to Salinas for treatment there, and then she went to Arizona, treatment there. And, you know, they were having a hard time finding her. Finally... After about 10 months, we got a phone call from the police department in Arizona and found out that she was living with one of the patrolmen who worked part-time at that uh, facility where the drug prevention facility, and he had taken her in, and she was living with him. She was only 15 years old at that particular time, and you're thinking, what kind of nutcase is this? You know, he's supposed to be a, a police officer. Now he's harboring a runaway, knowing she's a runaway, knowing she came out of a drug clinic, and you know, and people are looking for her. Well, needless to say, he paid a high price for those actions, and we brought her back, and only to find her to run away, and never saw her again. So here we got a missing person. We've got a missing child. To live through that is a horrible thing. And any time I see someone going through that scenario, I'm, I'll get all those feelings back again. I know what that feels like. There again, God used that to, to put in me a desire to want to be able to search out and find lost children, to be able to see in the Spirit and know where they're at. Here again, I'm saying also, your past and everything in it has purpose. You have to understand what that purpose is for to use it. But as you're using it, you can either get mad about it. You can blame somebody else for it. You can even get mad at God for it happening. But none of those things are going to benefit you in the days to come. But if you look at it that as if like a red rubber ball, the harder you throw it down on the ground, the higher it's going to go. The more you're abased in life will determine how high you'll go with God. And I learned that early on, and it helped me to be able to process a lot of these things that were happening and use it for good instead of just letting it tear me up. Then, I tell you, you think, oh, I'm making all this stuff up, <laughs> but I'm not. I mean, really, you look at it and you think, are you kidding me? Is all this stuff real? It is. And I... I guess it's, you know, partly because I needed to say all this, not just for you to know better who Kent Simpson is, but also for you to know that God uses all things for his glory. Everything. And if you think you're so bad you can't be used of God, you're kidding yourself. I mean, Apostle Paul was ordered to go kill Christians when he was a zealot. He was part of the army of, of the Israelis. He was Roman, he was Jewish, and he was also uh, someone of high caliber in, in knowledge and education for that time. And he was ordering people to stone people. He even was there the day Stephen, a holy man of God, is recorded in the book of Acts, was stoned to death as Paul, who, who at that time was called Saul, was watching over the garments as the men had disrobed in order to throw the stones at Stephen until he was killed. So God chose him to write more than two-thirds of the New Testament. Wasn't even a Christian 
until later on in his life. So even on these principles, we could realize the limitation, the only limitation we have of being used and empowered by God is by our own doubt and disbelief. Now, back to the story. <laughs> back to the other things. I felt like maybe I needed to just tone it down a little bit for you because I know some of this stuff's really heavy. And and you might be thinking, well, how did you make it through life? <laughs> well, without Jesus, I'm a mess. So I just hung on to him through the whole ride and I'm able to get through to this point. You know, we eventually saw that Living in Norman was not going to work. We had to get these kids out of this area. So I took a job as a bank president in a smaller community outside of Oklahoma City line. It was just right over the city limits. And get them in a smaller school, get them away from uh, these older older youth because they were finding the wrong people to run with. And I thought that would be a good thing, you know, because it'd be it'd be a lot closer. They wouldn't be able to go places that they were able to go to while they were in Norman. And, of course, we still are missing the daughter. She's still gone. We haven't seen her. I had a new house built and had their rooms specially made the way they wanted them. Um, and we still had her room ready for her if she ever showed back up, which she never did. Now, the son, you know, he was still trying to do what was right, trying to live a normal life. He just had a hard time. In fact, even at school, his mother would give the, the PE teacher a note, and sometimes she'd echo through the principal to do this, to excuse him from PE. And I said, why are you doing that? He needs to get the education and the physical education. He needs to be working out. He needs to start working toward exercising, and, you know, he's young. He, he, it's not going to hurt him. He said, that's not the problem. I said, what's the problem? She says he can't be around other boys. I thought, oh, no, okay, I got it now, because it embarrasses him. And I thought, well, that is, I'm not going to deal with that. I don't know how to even start trying to help him in that area, but it was just things like that were constantly popping up. Now, he was bored. He gets out of school, nothing to do, no friends. I mean, we're living in a farm, uh, farming part of the area of Oklahoma, and all those kids were farm kids, you know, farm and ranchers. So they were tough, and they, you know, really gave it gave the the boy a hard time, a real hard time. And I decided, well, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to help him. I'm going to bring him into the bank. And put him in the drive-in window and let him start learning to be a uh, teller in the bank. So he did that after school. He was on his senior year. And uh, and then one day, I had one of the, the head uh, teller come to me, sit out of my office, said, I hate to tell you this, but we got to do something. I said, what? She said, we're having trouble with your stepson. I said, okay, what what's the problem? She said, he's... Um, He's trying to make passes at men in the drive-in window. And I thought, oh, gosh, how embarrassing is this? Small community. Everybody knows who his stepdad is. It's me. And I finally had to let him let him go. I couldn't do that. So after he graduated, we sent I paid to have his education. And what he wanted to go into was interior design. And so that was in Dallas. And so got him an apartment. He's going to school there. You know, we kept coming down and checking on him because we had rental property in Texas anyway, so we had to go down there every so often. And uh, it was just, it got to the place to where he wasn't going to school. And, you know, paying for that was not cheap, so, you know, we kind of had to put our foot down a little bit, and they, all that did was just push him further away. Now, I tried one time. Uh, I started talking to him about the Lord. And he wasn't saying much. He wasn't talking. He wasn't answering questions. And, you know, I felt like, well, there's, you know, he's pretty far gone if I can't even talk to him about it. I won't even entertain it. But there was a point in time before he went off to college that really 
made sense of why he was the way he was and why he became so hard. There was a time when I was, I, we were living in, the new, living in the new home in the country, going to the country bank where I worked, and and he, one night, I, I got up early, I mean, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I felt something very uneasy in the house, and so I, I opened up the bedroom door and saw that there was the light still on in, in his room, and I could hear some mumbling, but I couldn't make out the words. But what was coming out of that room really, really was eerie feeling. And I didn't know exactly what to do about it. So when I got home, when I came home for lunch, nobody was home. And I especially just specifically made a trip home just to see what I could find out. So I went into his bedroom. He was at school. And uh, his mom was at work. And I went in to his room, and I started trying to figure out where what's going on in this room that, that's giving me this real eerie feeling and so I opened up his closet and there was a, a small tombstone black candles and it was all on a silver tray and it had a book a little booklet there so I opened up the booklet and looked at it, it was just scribbling all the way through there well, I thought they're doing something in here that's that's devilish I don't know exactly what it is so I began to question him about it. He didn't want to talk about it, of course, but I asked him, I said, well, at least tell me what all this scribbling is in the book. It, it looks like some child's been playing in there. He said, no, that's our, that's our book of interpretation of the devil, what he's saying. And I said, okay, so what are you doing, seances and that kind of thing? He said, sort of, kind of. And then later, it wasn't maybe a week later, we had one of our foreclosed properties which was a farm home that was two-story um was abandoned it caught fire and burned to the ground and when they checked it out they found out that they had been uh meeting in there some kids had been meeting in there and they set it on fire accidentally i believe um but they started looking for one particular boy well when they found this boy uh he was young. He was his teenager. He was a minor, and they found that he was carrying a piece of flesh in his back pocket that came out of the forehead of a little child that he had he had mutilated him for the purpose of worshiping Satan. This kid also went to his parents' home in that same week and shot them both. And then jumped in the bed and wallowed around in all of the blood, went to a Circle K convenience store, and killed the clerk there before they caught him. Now, this child was later on TV many times. Sometimes he was even on there for different evangelistic ministries. And he was warning kids not to start even entertaining the devil because that's what he did. And he said he just took possession. He said, I didn't know anything about what had happened until it was all over with, and they told me what I'd done. He said, if you let the enemy come in, he will take over, and you will lose total control of your thoughts, your actions, and all your deeds will come back to haunt you the rest of your days. Now, he, he became a Christian while he was in prison, on death row, because he got lot He got... It was executed, the youngest executed uh, on death row in the history of Oklahoma. He wasn't even an adult. They didn't even let him get up to the where he was an adult. It was so hideous. But this kid had been in my home. He was in my home doing these whatever you want to call it, devil-worshipping things in the house. Now, another thing that I have to say about all that, is that it helped me realize how bad that dark side was. It helped me to be able to identify it, and I can identify that same eerie feeling, and I can point it out in that right down to the individual. All these things were had purpose. They were horrible. They were sometimes even scary. They were, you know, also very embarrassing. Because what happened, you know, after that, we needed to get our steps, my stepson out of the town. 
That's why we sent him to this college in Dallas. Uh, thought at least maybe he could put himself together and he won't be around this because it went from from bad to, to as bad as you could get. I mean, going from the city to going out and drag to coming around, hanging around devil worshipers and murderers is about as bad as you can get. But it really re did give me insight, and God used everything that I experienced in all this and all of my marriages, all of my life's experiences to help me to be able to understand life and also that that's not life. John 10, 10 really had a lot more effect on me because when I read Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, I really understand. But I also know the rest of that verse is that Jesus comes to give life and life more abundant. I live that part. And that part I've been able to understand and not only understand it, but live it to its fullest. And the peace is what creates that atmosphere. Because wherever there's peace, the Prince of Peace is in it. It was not long after all of that. I had so much going on in my life. I had, I was uh, overseeing four banks and an insurance company and president of the bank I was regularly at, regularly to be found at. And one day, I've got a shopping center going in town, building, getting ready to build a shopping center. And one day I'm driving through town and I stop at the four-way stop. And God says, will you give my church $75,000? Well, I knew exactly what church it was. It was the church that I attended Easter and Christmas. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. That's about all I did. I might have done gone there a couple of more times than that, but not much. But God wanted me to give the church $75,000. Well, within myself, I didn't know exactly what to say. I said, Lord, I said, I don't have that much cash on me, but if you want me to sell something, whatever you want me to do, just let me know. Well, he never said anything else. So I went on about down the road, got back to the bank, started to keep working, and eventually I bought a piece of property across from a lady that lived across the street from the bank. I'd been trying to buy it from her, and she wasn't going to sell it to me. And eventually, you know, I thought I'd just give up. And then one day... Right after I got back from the Lord talking about giving the church $75,000, I got to the bank, got busy working, and he says, go see Beulah. That was a little old lady who lived across the street. So I thought, Lord, you sure you want me to go do this to the lady? You'd probably run me off. And But I knew I had to go do it. So I went over there and knocked on her door, and she says, oh, it's you again. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, so I suppose you're here about the land. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, come on in. Let's have a cup of coffee. So I thought, well, that's breaking some ice there. So as she's preparing the coffee, I'm sitting on the sofa. She comes in with a tray with the coffee, cream, and sugar, sets it down, and I'm sitting down, and she sets that tray down on the coffee table, look, stands up and looks at me, still standing. She looks at me, she says, I don't know why I'm going to do this, but I'm going to let you have that land, but I don't want all the money up front. I only want a little bit now, and when you get ready to start building that shopping center, I'll take the balance then. I said, okay. So we put it in a contract with attorneys and got it all signed. And I gave her her uh, deposit money or the money to secure the contract. And then three weeks later after we signed it, the state came in and made an announcement. They were making a three-way, a two-lane, a four-lane highway on two roads that cornered the intersection of that piece of property right on the corner. So the corner of the property was sit at an intersection that had two four-lane roads going by it. That's a lot of traffic. So the value of that property tripled just in three weeks. So say if it's 100000 now it's 300000 And that happened just because of the announcement of the highway. Well, there was going to be more than enough money for me to, be, for me to make just on the land sale, actually $200,000, and I was only have to give God 75000 of it. So that was a good deal. But I hadn't even remembered. I forgot all about it. God talking to me because I've been so busy working with everything. I forgot about the most important thing that I should have remembered. The most important thing I should have been working toward. And the most important thing I should have been watching for is God making a way for me to have that $75,000 to give to the church. Well, there was a lesson to be learned there because what happened next is I wound up in the hospital with having back surgery. All of a sudden, my back goes out on me. I'm 36 years old. 
I'm a young guy, you know, and I have my back surgery. Six months later, I go in with double pneumonia. And while I'm in double, having double pneumonia and I'm in the hospital, they run some uh, tests on me. They need to do some x-rays, and they put this IVB dye in my bloodstream to color my organs so they could see. They thought maybe I had cancer in my kidneys, which I didn't, and I didn't think I did. But I had an allergic reaction to that dye as they were putting it in, and it almost killed me. I mean, it literally almost killed me. I was in the emergency room. Um, it was it was a pretty close call. But what happened because of that allergic uh, episode, it messed up my thinking. It messed up my mind. My processing was all off. I, 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 I had all kinds of issues. So I tried to go back to work. I couldn't do it. And that's when God started reminding me of when he called me in 1976 that he wanted me to be a prophet. And I thought, what is a prophet? From Ezekiel chapter 33, you read that old chapter, you'll see in the end, the latter part of that chapter, it says that when people come to hear what the word of the Lord is and you give them the word of the Lord, they'll not believe, except when they see that word come to pass, they'll know they stood in the presence of a prophet. Well, I had no idea what that was. It had been 10 years. Now it's 1986. And the Lord's making me now finally give up my life of what I wanted to do, mainly because, one thing, I didn't obey him. The second part is, he was going to make me be a prophet whether I wanted to or not. I didn't have a choice. He broke me down to where I was near death. And I finally said, okay, I give, I'm give. i uncle. I give it up. I give it up. Please. <laughs> you know, Lord, I'll do whatever you want to do. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Just tell me. And from that point on, I realized I've got to do, i got to change my whole life. So I went and bought a motorhome. I resigned from the bank. And my wife had a lot of property going on up in Pocket City that she was still working with the attorney, still doing a lot of work for him with him. They were partners in a lot of stuff. And so I just said, look, I'm, I'm going to get in the motorhome and I'm going to get out of town. I'm gone. I'll, I'll be around somewhere sometime. Just call me if you need me. Well, I thought I was outrunning God. I thought I was getting away from God. I stopped by a Christian bookstore and went in and got audio cassette tapes, the whole series of the New Testament. I started playing them as I was headed to California. And about the second or third tape, whether it's Mark or Luke, I don't remember, I got upset because I realized these are the same stories. They just changed the labels on these tapes. I was about ready to turn back and drive all the way back there and go get my money back. But I didn't because I'd already gone too far. That was how foolish I was, how ignorant I was about the Bible. I knew nothing about the Bible. But I had the desire to want to learn, and I knew I couldn't do anything else. God shut the door on everything else. He basically said, your grace has run out. And I knew what he meant when he said my grace had run out. I cannot mess up anymore. I have to walk. I have to walk according to the way he wants to do it, and I have to find out what he wants to do before I do anything. I no longer could guess at it. I no longer could have some kind of assumption about it. I couldn't decide whether it was an older woman would work or a country girl would work or somebody loves me more than I love them. No, it had to be one God po checked out for me. Whoever it is God has for me, that's who it'll be, and no, or nobody else will. And that was my determination. A lot of things happened from there, and I'll pick that up later, and we'll go on. But I just want you to know that no matter what you've been through, God will use it for good if you allow him. And like I said, I, won't, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing from everything that I've been through because it's really giving me spiritual insight into a lot of things. It also has helped me to discover the value of praying, hearing, and obeying God. It's the only way. It's the Christian way. And with that, that's all I'm going to say about this part seven. So until next week, may God bless you, keep you, and bring you unto an understanding of all the things that have happened. Rejoice in it. Be glorified in your suffering, because in your suffering, there's something to be learned. God bless you. Amen.